And welcome. Thanks. Thanks for, for talking with me here. Really appreciate it. And Emmer, yeah, thanks, James. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit about your background and why your interest in data viz, reporting, program evaluation, all that good stuff? Give us a, give us a little context and background. Yeah, so I'm actually about to have my work anniversary, and I'm about to start my seventh year of working for myself, which is crazy. I feel like I just started yesterday, and you blink and seven years have gone by. So now I do a mix of training and consulting on data visualization. So all the in-person training has gone online. Of course, I do online courses, online workshops for, for my clients, federal agencies, universities, groups like that. But I didn't always do this. So I used to work as an evaluator in a couple of different settings in a university-based research center, doing NIH-funded studies in a consulting firm, in a nonprofit, in another consulting firm, working with foundations. And I always liked the data viz side of it. Like some people love creating logic models. That's not for me. That is not my thing. I've created a million. I'm not yeah. doing any more logic models. Or some people love doing lit reviews. That's what they're so good at. They love pouring through the research, finding mm -hmm. what's been done before, synthesizing that. That's not for me either. That feels so, like such a chore. But looking through spreadsheets for me is it's like my best day ever. I love doing that and figuring out what the patterns are. Mm -hmm. And I remember really getting into it early on. When was it? It was one of my first jobs. So I was, what, like 23 or something. And I was so optimistic, you know, just a little kid right out of college. I'm going to go change the world with data-driven decision-making and evaluation. And I was working on this one evaluation and it was an evaluation of charter schools, which at the time in the DC area were pretty new, hence the evaluation to see, are they working? Is it worth all the money and the effort? And I still had that college mindset of you work till the job's done. If you have to work nights or weekends, so be it. You just want to do your best work. So I was working, you know, a little bit late in, at night. And I remember my boss came into the office and she was so kind and such a mentor, not just a boss, like so wonderful. And she was like, and I need to talk to you about something. And I remember <laughs> having fight or flight response. I think my face and, you know, chest turned red and she closed the door. And I was like, am I getting fired? What's going on? I've only been here a couple of months. I was so worried. And she was like, you're a really good team member. I'm so glad to have you. And I'm like, okay, I'm not getting fired. And she goes, I've noticed you're working really late on this evaluation report. This report matters, sure. But I don't want you to sacrifice your personal life for a dusty shelf report. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And she was like, you know how it is. This evaluation's required. It's just to check a box nobody's going to use this anyway. This report is just going to get filed away. Would you read this? You wouldn't read this, would you? And I was like, why am I staying late for this? And she was like, exactly. Like, go live your life, work on a good, you know, do a good report, but recognize the limitations of this format too. And like what it's really able to do and what it's not. And I remember instantly feeling crushed because I really cared about that report and I was very bought into the like data can change the world mindset, which I still, still am bought into. But I remember just thinking there's gotta be a better way. It can't be that we just do reports as evaluators, you know, and this was over 10 years ago. So this was when the technical report was the thing. This was kind of all evaluators had to offer. Yeah. But since then, I mean, people have added one pagers and dashboards and infographics and slideshows. And I've seen the field just, explode with creativity over the past decade, um, which is really exciting. But I knew like in that moment when my boss was talking to me about this dusty shelf report, like I've got to find a better way. I've got to find a better way. This can't be the standard. I just, I wasn't ready to accept that yet. And so figuring that out, that's been sort of like the, you know, what, what you've, you've devoted your, your effort to, right? So that is our, is that, you know, like why students kind of leads to my next question, like students, they should have some focus on that, like on that whole thing, like making reports actually used or useful because I, yeah, I remember I heard that too. I heard that too on a, on a project where it was kind of like the message was like, 
yeah, it's uh, such a big report. Probably no one's going to read it anyway. You know, something like that came up, up across. And so how, how do, how do you get, um, you know, students like, you know, like, like, you know, um, proficiency in this, let me ask you that, you know, right off the bat, like, um, it, it sounds like students in evaluation and other areas, they should be concerned about this. They should, you know, they should want to learn more about this. Um, how, you know, how can they learn about it? Like, what's the best way? Because I don't remember taking a course in report writing. It was very secondary data visualization, nothing. Talk to me a little bit about that. So. Yeah. So if you're working in academia, if you're a professor, if you work in a university as a staff member or a librarian, if you're a student in grad school classes, absolutely write academic reports. That's absolutely the correct format for that audience in that context. But the trouble is, what if you don't stay in academia? What if you go into consulting? What if you work at a nonprofit? What if you go into philanthropy? What if you work for the government? You know, there's many other workplace settings that have their own standard that the bar is being raised so much in a good way, thinking beyond the report. Like, can we also have interactive dashboards? Can we also have infographics? Just, you know, amazing things are being done. So that's, that's the tricky part, right? Is none of us were trained. How do you go from technical reports in academic settings to non-technical reports, non-technical audiences, really quick turnaround times. Let's see, so students just getting started. Ooh, I've got yeah, some like, good if they had, like if someone had a year, let's say, and 10 hours per week to devote to something like this, like to getting educated around this. Yeah. Right? Let's say they were an eval student or like a, someone just out, you know, starting to work. Mm -hmm. and they had that time. What, you know, what kind of stuff would you have them do? Well, they could take one of my courses, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, but I have, I have great other resources to tell them about too. So one thing that I did for myself early on that was so helpful was I created a data viz wall of fame, not a wall of shame where you're purposefully just being a negative person looking for bad examples to make fun of. Nobody learns from that, but a wall of fame. So I literally used to look on social media in magazine articles newspaper articles, newspaper websites, other evaluation reports, conference presentations, kind of all these outlets that you're naturally encountering. Yeah. And think of what are some great graphs you've seen? Where, like, what is it that makes this dashboard really good? Did you see a really good infographic that caught your eye? Who's got a really nicely formatted report? But you purposely collect all of them. So I used to print them out and just literally had a wall above my desk and it was just plastered with, you know, my 20 favorite examples. You could build a Pinterest board nowadays. That's probably the more modern way to do it. Favorite, the ones you love on Twitter. Create a folder on your computer of screenshots of your favorites. Mm -hmm. But start by just actively collecting examples that you love. But then push yourself to the next level, which is what is it that's so effective about this? Coming up with, I don't know, I can geek out with you because you're in evaluation too, but what's a rubric for that? Like, what are the criteria of what makes this good? Is there something with the writing that makes it really interesting and engaging? Yeah. Is there something about the type of visual? Maybe it's not just bar charts. Maybe it's some innovative chart type you haven't seen. Is there something uh, where they're not just showing national data, but they're disaggregating it and you've got all these state by state or county by county examples that's so interesting. It helps you dive into the de details. Like what is it exactly that makes it good? Because then once you can kind of put that into words of why it's so great, you can start to replicate that. Like, what is it about the colors? Oh, I could do colors like that. Okay. Or what is it about the graph title that makes it so easy to read? Where can I replicate that? So keeping a wall of fame, not a wall of shame. There's a lot of great podcasts out there too. Um, the three that come to mind, no, maybe four for DataViz would be DataViz Today, with Ali Torben is really good. She'll talk about new developments, new research that's out. She has guests on there. Data Stories with Enrico Bertini and Moritz, I hope I'm saying his last name right, Stefaner, Stefaner. Um, theirs is great too. They have a lot of guests, not people from evaluation and research, but it's like yeah, this yeah, sure. scientist got into data and this graphic designer got into data and you get to see all of these correct ways. Uh -huh. To learn about data viz. 
Data Plus Love with Zach Bowders, the Policy Vids podcast with John Schwabish. So podcasts are great. I listen to podcasts every single day. So if you listen to, you know, a podcast here and there, I mean, you're thinking of if this student had 10 hours a week, great. Spend an hour or two of that right. on podcast time. But you can do that. Yeah, you can do that while while walking or while, you know, doing something else or whatever. Just, yeah, just for, for entertainment. Absolutely. Podcast constantly also. Yep. And uh, it's, it's a great way to learn. Um, what about the reporting side though? Like how would you, how would you teach them? How can they learn about better reporting? Is it also just like finding like exemplars as you know, also, and like finding the elements of those reports that really stood out for them and how they could start to like speak, speak about the reporting side as well. Cause there's the data viz, there's the reporting, they relate, but they're not, they're not the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. With reporting, probably the best place to start is probably a self-assessment to really think about the reports you're currently working on or for people with more work experience, maybe they're currently receiving reports like this and just think about what is the impact of those reports, if any. That's number one, like recognizing how are you currently doing? Self-assessment wise, I'd say there's four red flags to really watch for with reports. And this isn't just a dusty shelf report. It could be a dusty slideshow, a dusty dashboard that you pour a lot of energy into, but doesn't really go anywhere. So red flags are great, great, great starting place. So one is, let's say you work on this report or slideshow, whatever format it is, you email it off to somebody, no response. They've communicated to you Uh by not communicating. Like it's, there's no real world change. There's no programmatic change. There's no policy change. It's not like people are increasing or decreasing their budget based on it or increasing or decreasing staffing. Like there's no difference. So the whole point of evaluation is not happening. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, it's just checking the box, right? Like we're just going through the motions we've been asked to do this evaluation. Great. Here's your deliverable. It's a report or a slideshow. We're done here. You know, that's really common. I hear from people every single day. Oh, like I didn't realize something else was supposed to happen next. Or let's say you post your report on a website. Mm -hmm. Nothing else happens. Like you post it and it's done. Red flag number two. I used to hear this all the time. Way too many years. I spent way too many years making dusty shelf reports by accident. You email your report off to somebody, you get a response and you think, yes, they emailed me back. Yes, I'm winning here. But the response is like, thanks. I got the report. I'll let you know if I have any questions. It's this promise to follow up. You know, if I have questions, I'll ask you. If we need more info later, we'll ask you. That's not use. You know, we can, we can do better than that. Red flag number three for these students to really think about is it sounds like a compliment. It's not. So you have to kind of like read between the lines, figure out is this a compliment or not. You email the report off to somebody, you get a response. Yes, it's the best day ever. But the response is something like, thanks. We received the report. We'll let you know if we have any questions. I can tell that a really technical team worked on this report Mm -hmm. or It was really thorough. Wow, this was very detailed. It was so in-depth. It's things that if you're writing for a fellow technical audience of people who love data and numbers, that's me. I love spreadsheets. I love tables. I love being in spreadsheets all day, every day. But I have to remind myself that's like 1% of the world. Most people would rather be managing the programs, leading the staff, you know, running the organizations. There's some other specialty that they have. So... I used to hear this a lot and I would think, well, great. The person receiving our report must have looked up my whole team on LinkedIn and they, they can tell that we present at AEA conferences and we really value continuing education and professional development. And they can tell we all have master's degrees and PhDs. And it's like, I didn't realize that this compliment was a problem until a couple jobs later, I went to work as the internal evaluator at a nonprofit uh-huh. And I had to present at our quarterly board meetings. So we have, you know, this big conference room table, really yeah. important people on this big board. It's like, yeah. you know, the, the person from the mayor's office and the representative from the school board, really, really high up 
really smart people. And um, this isn't it, this is a bill for, for new flooring, but you get the idea. Um, this one woman, I'm like overhearing this conversation and she's got a table that I had made for her of all of our stats on whether our work was making a difference. She kind of turns to the other board member and she's like, another one of these technical reports, kind of rolled her eyes and like huffed. And I thought, oh, technical is an insult. <laughs> like, oops, I didn't, who knew? I didn't know. And when I heard it talked about that way, I had this light bulb moment of, okay, wait, when else have I heard technical? Way, way too much, which again, is a great thing for some audiences in some settings, but like usually most audiences are gonna be non-technical. And then the fourth red flag I'd want students to think about is sometimes this is the best to hear because people are blunt. They'll flat out say, do you have another format? Right. We can't read this. Do you also have a slideshow? Is there a one pager? Maybe there's a five page brief. It's usually re a request for another format. And this is a positive trend in the field. I've started seeing this with a lot of government agencies that used to require technical reports. Now they're also requiring a one pager or a mm -hmm. two pager. It's just, it's written into the contract from the beginning. Yeah. Everybody bidding on that work knows it's required. It's expected. Yeah. It's just part of the way that you do business. So that's the best starting point is probably to think about how are our reports doing currently? Do we need to change or not? And, and for a lot of us, it's like, yeah, of, of, of course, there are opportunities for improvement. Yeah. Let me ask you, like, how do you engage people, the, the users of evaluation, the stakeholders? How do you engage them before, like, as you're writing the report, before, you know, everything leading up to actually the report? Like, how do you get them on board, contributing, giving insight, like, knowing what they want? Um, however you want to define engagement, you know, like, how do you, how do, you do that? Like, what's the best yeah. way? Are there are some, like, tips or, or ideas you have around that? Yeah. Are you familiar with the term data placemat? No. Well, I will send you a resource guide on it, an article that my supervisor and I wrote together. It was probably seven years ago at this point, but it's, it's a classic, I, I think it's a classic, wonderful article that's timeless. And it's about this concept of data placemats, or you've heard this term, participatory data analysis. And it's the idea of you don't wait till the end of the project to just say, here's this completed report or slideshow or dashboard. It's, it's not just like, okay, we did it. Here it is as a gift to you. Go use it somehow. I oh, hope. Nice. Fingers crossed. Su surprise. Here's all this data you didn't know about. It's this three-step process. <laughs> Lots of finger counting today. <laughs> you can tell I'm a numbers person. I can't help myself. Okay. At well, least you're holding up the right number of fingers. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> So Sometimes I hold them up wrong. Sometimes I'm like, how, seven, eight, what? what do, this is an easy one. Three, three. Okay, um, so step one is you make something called a data placemat. And it's, it's not, sounds fancier than it is. You just use Word or PowerPoint and you're laying out basically one graph per finding. Let's say you do a survey. Let's say there's 20 questions on the survey. You literally have like question one on the survey. Here's a bar chart of how people responded. Question two, here's a bar chart of how people responded. It doesn't okay. have to be formatted nice. In fact, the charts shouldn't be formatted too much. I would recommend, there's a big movement that I am behind and love of putting the takeaway finding directly in the graph title, mm -hmm. which usually I'd want people to do, but not in data placemats. I would recommend the graph title is, is literally just the survey question. It's just the phrase or the topic of the graph there's no dark light contrast in the graph. There's no like, everything's grayed out, but this one key finding stands out. None of that, it's just a one color graph. Right. So you develop these data placemats of draft findings, preliminary findings. There's no analysis. It's just like, here's what we've got so far. And then step two is you hold a meeting with these people, which used to be in person. Now you do it some, somehow online. You'd think about how to adapt this online and you get all the stakeholders in the project to come to this participatory meeting. And you kind of sit back a little bit as the evaluator. You're not like talking at them, here are the findings, but you're posing discussion questions and you're just listening. You're very much of a listening role. And you ask them things like, okay, let's look at survey question one for starters. What stands out? What surprises you? What might explain this finding? What additional details do you need? Like you're walking them through how to think about the data. 
and let them have those light bulb moments themselves. And they might say things like, wow, we serve way more males than females. I would have thought it was more 50-50. Mm-hmm. I wonder how we recruited people to get such an interesting gender mix in our program. That's really surprising to me. And like, you listen to them kind of tell the story of what might be leading to some type of gender imbalance or whatever the data is about. Right. But then, and you're, you're furiously taking notes in the background or you, you bring along, a, you know, a, somebody else to be furiously typing notes. You're hearing what matters to them, like what they're, okay, right. Yeah, and you're also hearing it's almost like a focus group. It's like qualitative data collection where you're listening of the why behind that data. Like, did the results go down one year because they had a bunch of staffing changes? Their budget got cut in half. Well, of course they're not going to have as good a fund. Like you, you get to hear everything that's going on in the program that sometimes as the evaluator you know about, but like not necessarily. There's a lot that goes on day to day in a program that you just, you may not hear unless you're there 40 plus hours a week. So it's like a data source. That's that's like a data source in itself. Like that whole that workshop or that experience, you can really get gather some additional data there, some additional mm-hmm. information about like what's going on, some explanations, at not yep. just uh, and and some and some insights, some whys as well. So that's pretty. Yeah. Neat. You have that article that you could you could share. You could maybe give us a link to, and we can. Yeah, it's in NDE New Directions for Evaluation. It's public facing now. I think when it first came out, it was behind a paywall, or you had to have a subscription. It's not anymore. So I'll send that to you if you want to link it below. That would be great. Yeah. So you're doing the data placemat, then you're listening to their explanation of what's going on and letting them have those aha moments where you're truly just kind of listening. But then three, that's a natural step. You take all that data you collected from them and you take all of their insights and you put that into the report. So the report is so much better. It's co-created too, which they have buy-in. They're more likely to use it when they're bought in. But it's not just like, here's the survey data. It's here's the survey data, plus all of these things of what might be going on. They've already naturally in that meeting started thinking about what's next, how they're going to use the data, what, you know, how they need to make little improvements to get things back on track. So you have your whole recommendations page already written with all of their great ideas. And it's just this great report that they have taken ownership in now too. So I I love participatory data analysis. I've been using it for years, had so much success with it. Do you, you go through like through next steps with them, like explicitly, like what will you, what would you do that with the report or like how will it be used? Is that something that you yeah. would, would talk about as well during those sessions? You certainly could. I've done that with a couple of groups where you'd say, okay, like you mentioned a couple of things already, but let's formally talk about this maybe for 15 minutes. And sometimes I'll just write on the whiteboard where I'm truly the listener because I don't know, you know, there's that fine line as an evaluator, like, am I an outsider? Am I an insider? How much say should I have on what they do? Or am I just collecting data? Like there's that fine line there. So I'm usually the one writing on the whiteboard of, you know, what are your next steps? Okay. Like Bob mentioned this and Nancy mentioned this. What else have we got? What's a natural next step to use this data? And I'm thinking of a time I did this with a workforce development program. It was really natural things. It was like, oh, we need to strengthen our intake process. We need to make sure that everybody who comes in the door, we're communicating with them very well. We don't want them to have a fuzzy idea of what's about to happen in this career coaching program. You know, we need to maybe just make a one-page brochure for them to kind of onboard our new people in this career coaching program. It was just very, very straightforward. Things that I think in the busyness of everyday life, people forget, but once you get all the key people in a room and they have a designated hour or two to do some planning, it's like very natural for them to think about what's next. Nice. Well, great, great ideas. Um, What would you say like are other, you've, I think talked about some of these, like the mistakes that are common, but any other mistakes that you've seen evaluators make since you, you know, you're very familiar with our work, your work, yeah, um, colleagues and, and all this stuff. What kind of, what, what have you seen that are just like, hey, don't do this. Do this I don't, Yeah, I don't see this in every report all the time. So here's just, here's a long laundry list. Um, right. Probably the first one is that people only have a report. They're putting all their eggs in one basket. They're thinking, I've got all these different audiences or stakeholder groups I'm trying to reach. Yeah. I'll just think of all the data all those people might need and I'll jam it into one poor PDF. And like, you're, you're just hope 
reports can't do that much. Reports are not capable of meeting everybody's needs. So one product per audience, you know, think about, okay, this audience is going to get an infographic and this audience gets a dashboard and this audience really needs the 10 page summary. And this audience we're going to go present to in person. So we've got some slides with key findings, like making sure that you're diversifying how you're sharing the data, right. which you really have to plan for from the beginning. That's not like, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, our report's due tomorrow. It's 4.59 p.m. Let's quickly make some more deliverables. That has to come from the beginning, too. So I realize as I say that it's a little aspirational. You know, that's something that you can't conquer in just one project that you're just, you're working towards improving all the time. Um, another one I see is, this is because we're, this is how we were trained to do it for peer-reviewed articles. We bury the most important information, usually on the last page. There's some implications or findings and that's the part that really makes a difference yeah. i wish that people would put that so what really early on mm -hmm. like first page and just put people into the action put them in the game like in the action not like you have to wade through 10 or 30 or 100 pages to get to the key finding but right away like here's what matters here are our key findings not having you know a multi-page executive summary and then you have a multi-page literature review and like you're just waiting you're, you're risking losing your audience of course so i wish people would start with the so what earlier this is such an easy one i wish people would use brand guidelines more just the simple stuff font and color mm -hmm. and i wish people too would use the recipients brand guidelines so i've worked in a lot of consulting settings I'm a consultant now with my own LLC, but using whoever it's going to, their, their brand identity, their fonts and colors, so that it shows that you've gone the extra mile. It takes 10 minutes to do, as if it's this like hard day long thing. But you've, you've put in some effort to be professional for them, but it also, they can see themselves in the data. Like think of all the reports they might get in their inbox or all the reports that might be printed out and sitting on their desk. Mm -hmm they can look at the one that's in their fonts and colors and they're like, oh, this one's for me. It just helps them identify with the data a little bit more. Gosh, there's so many others. I wish, this is very aspirational compared to how we were all trained to do it, but I wish that everybody would have at least one visual per page. No more text walls, no more like, you know, maybe every other page has a graph, but that every single page has a visual. And I define visual very broadly. So it could be, let's say a bunch of agencies are working together on a program, show their logos, you know, have little one by one inch logos of each group to recognize their efforts. Or if you're talking about a longer process, maybe it's this multi-year project, include a little timeline. You could make it in PowerPoint. It could literally be insert shape with arrows and text boxes that you've made in PowerPoint. And you don't have to use anything, any fancy software to do this, but maybe right. a timeline. You could include simple diagrams, um, simple things like a pyramid shape or concentric circles or an org chart, like really simple stuff that you get literally in smart art in Word and PowerPoint. But aiming for at least one visual per page is, it's not impossible. I mean, it's once you think about, okay, you know, a visual could be logos, timelines, diagrams, graphs, of course, maps, tables, photos. There's so many options to choose from. Once you kind of just think like, okay, that's the bar I'm going to set for myself. Every single page will have at least a visual. It's pretty easy to knock out. Usually people, once they get this idea and make it a priority, usually their next report is so much more engaging. It could be used really effectively to explain concepts and also creating visuals, concept maps. I mean, our, log our logic models that like we talked about before, they're a great way to, to explain things, but also to learn about things. I mean, you're learning about a new concept, you know, creating the visual itself, um, having to create that and uh, is a good way to, to show or to understand the relationships between variables, like, like you said, like how it, a study was run, the different like steps, uh, the relationship between the different like data sources or the different methods, all these kind of things. So, so visuals can, can be, should be used in much greater frequency. Another recommendation, but any other wishes that you have or that's uh, we could just keep so going. Many. <laughs> so many. I uh, wish that we would all, you can do this in word. You can do this on any, any free Google tool. I wish we would all put in 
doesn't even have to be all of your report's contents. Do a couple test pages, grab some of the text from your report, yeah. put it into a reading level tool that measures the reading level of your writing. And think about your audience. So the average, do you know what the average American reads at? Do you think it's like 12th grade reading level, first grade reading level? What do you think the average American adult reads at? I'm going to guess eighth grade. Yep, six to eight, middle school level. Eight, Many yeah. people have gone to education before that, but we, we don't always read at our same education level. So I, I advise people to think about your audience. What's their education level? Let's say it's a master's degree audience. Mm -hmm. I would aim two levels below that. So not just college level, but high school level. So I think for a lot of evaluation audiences, this is, this is highly specific to all of our different projects, but ninth to 12th grade reading level, you can still include terms like standard deviation or p-value here and there, mm -hmm. but it can be at a ninth grade reading level. So we're not dumbing down our writing. We're, and there's such good guidance online of how to actually lower the reading level of your writing. It's things like, don't have run on sentences that are 50 million words long, have shorter sentences. I have to do that a lot. I'll look through my own drafts. Uh -huh. My drafts are just the worst. The, they're so long, the longest sentences, like all these commas are in there and semicolons and terrible run on sentences. I just look through wherever I have a comma, I think, could this be a period? And when you do that a couple times, the reading level goes down a couple notches. So it's, it's such an easy fix. Sometimes you have to find synonyms. That can be a little bit harder. Like how do you, how do you accurately talk about some evaluation terms that are, they're jargon, right? They're like yeah. just people doing evaluation know about them. How do you actually talk about that in a way that's non-jargony? That takes more thought. That's, so that's more of like. Extra words we put in stuff. Like we were working on a survey together as a group, uh, earlier survey to get questions. Mm -hmm. We're trying to simplify, kind of take the, the, the reading, like the level down a bit, but it's just good to do it regardless of that. Like just yeah. making it simple, like getting rid of extra words, like in order, you know, like when you put like, you know, just put like, you know, like getting, getting rid of all these like, you know, words like, you know, additionally, specifically, like a lot of those kind of things that you just sort of add to things that don't necessarily add much to it. Um, yeah and just get, get senses all, you know, fancy and complicated things that, that I would have put in, you know, in graduate school to sound smarter, basically. Yep. Yeah. What do people call it? Like flowery language? Is yeah. that the term that we, we all tried to do to all of our papers to, oh, it has to be an eight page paper. I better add in all these stupid words that don't add anything to lengthen my paper. Yeah. All that stuff. I mean, so finding synonyms, I think is really, I find that to be very difficult personally, but shortening sentences, we can all do that. Um, sometimes just some, sometimes there are easy synonyms where you can swap out a long word with lots of syllables and letters for a shorter word. Like instead of additionally, it's Two, T O O. You know, there are there are some easier words to use. And again, it's not it's not treating our audience like they're children. It's not dumbing down. It's not like I am this expert and you are this dummy who doesn't know my words. It's not like that. It's more, I think of it more as respecting people's time and respecting that I know all this evaluation language or research language, but you know about your specialty. Like you've had lots of training and years of experience in some other field you have your own lingo that you know, you know, and like when we talk to each other, we have to respect that we just have different expertise and that's okay. So yeah, I just wish everybody would actually measure the reading level of their report and usually notch it down, usually a lot. Ninth to 12th grade reading level is what I would recommend for most audiences. And at the end of the day, we want our stuff to get used. And so you're speaking about all these sort of these tactics, these these methods for doing that, and I think that that's that's yeah. Great. Um, as um as I was painting my dining room because you know I just moved into a new house the other day, the other month. Um, I was painting my dining room and I was listening to your interview with Michael Quinn Patton, and I was going back and thinking how much Michael has had an influence on my career because I think that was maybe one of the first half day workshops I ever took at an AEA conference. I took his evaluation use or uh -huh. utilization focused evaluation workshop. Yeah. And I was just so bought in. I thought, oh, evaluations don't have to sit on a dusty shelf. You can actually inform programs and policies with evaluation, but you have to do it in a little bit different way to get that outcome. 
And I think the next year I went to a workshop about developmental evaluation and being able to pivot during a project. And I was like, oh, of course. And, you know, it's interesting to reflect back. I would have gone to those workshops, you know, 10 years ago, but that's, that's infused in me now into everything I do. So I'm so glad that I found him early on in my career that his, he was able to like push me down the use path early on that I wasn't on this dusty shelf report path for forever and ever, um, which, which could have happened if I didn't discover him, luckily. I think he's had a tremendous influence on a lot of people. You know, yeah. That whole orientation is, is a very important one, focusing on use and, and engagement of, of, uh, the, of the users. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so another question. All right. Uh, you've developed all kinds of cool stuff. All right, classes, lessons, blog posts, the whole range of whole range of, of things to help people with what we're talking about. What are you most proud of? Like which, like where, you know, I don't know. Like what, what, what is like one of the, one or, or two of those things that you are like, you know what, this, this, this is uh, something that's helpful. This is something that I feel like I, I really know. Yeah, so I've been teaching data viz since I started working for myself seven years ago in on-site workshops and shorter webinars. But then I didn't start teaching online until just 2018. And I started really small with one mini course. There was no charge for it. I still have that course. I'll tell people about it later in case they want to sign up for it. And it was literally just seven existing YouTube videos I had about, yes, they were all under the data viz umbrella, but they're all kind of sorted, uh, assorted. So there was an icon video and a what's data storytelling video and how do you make sure you're not just doing reports that all your eggs aren't put in one basket, relying on this report too much. And, you know, it was kind of seven videos that I really liked that I'd already made as part of blog posts in previous years. And I just packaged those together and, and called it a course, knowing that not everybody has been reading every single newsletter or blog post that I've ever written but that packaging things inside a, a course would be a shortcut for them. So I started there, you know, just a few years ago, yeah. but since then I've built up and now I have six full length courses. So each of those six is the equivalent of if it was an on-site workshop with a client, it would be like a two day workshop. So really in depth, not just recorded content, but they each have eBooks, like multi hundreds of pages, manuals that go along with them and shorter handouts. I don't, I don't just write dusty shelf report eBooks. That'd be terrible. Um, you know, they have Excel files or PowerPoint files to follow along office hours and things. Uh -huh. And of those six, you know, I've gotten, I figured out how to do this the long hard way. Right. So I started with like that mini course that was just seven lessons and kind of worked up. And the one I just finished, I'm not saying this just because we're talking about reports, but the report redesign course that I just finished mm -hmm. is by far the best and I'm the proudest of. And I think that's because I organized everything really intentionally. I tried to do this for every course, but I just think I finally, finally nailed it. It only took six courses to do this, but I try to organize everything in a framework so that it's not just here's 10 tips or random things, but this course has a pyramid where mm -hmm. you start at the base level of going beyond the report and it's all the mindset and the strategy of like what does this audience need versus this audience need and then you move on to structuring the report global edits like the skeleton of the report of branding how do you have a color what chapters should come first second and third how do you use colors by chapter to guide people through and then page by page edits like making sure you have one visual per page what type of visuals there's this checklist of 15 types of visuals how do you check your reading level? How do you have inclusive language? What about people first language? Like all the page by page, more granular edits. Mm -hmm. Other courses I've done have had a framework, but it's been more like, here's a five step process, one, two, three, four, five. And this one just of like, kind of starting from broader skills and working your way up to more sophisticated skills. It just makes sense that way. Um, I didn't, finally, I don't know why I didn't do this from the beginning, because I didn't know. I included an activity after every video and it's, I used to, I used to have activities kind of, I would say like, great. Now you've learned this thing, go apply it. Yeah. And it was just kind of guidance and like, go use this. And now there are specific questions of comment below this video with blah, 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 blah. Go find an example of this from your work, comment, share it. I'll give you feedback or go create a one pager 
Mm -hmm. post a screenshot here so I can give you feedback. So every single video has very, very specific guidance. And is everybody in the entire class seeing the feedback or the, the post and, and then they see your feedback. So that's sort of like a group or yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're learning from me, but they're also learning from each other. And we had um, 75 people join this last cohort and it's researchers and evaluators that you know, that you've seen at conferences, Canadian Evaluation Society members, a, a lot of people worldwide too, not just Americans. Yeah, but yeah. then it's so cool. I get to log in, just put it on my to-do list I do every day. I log in and I see all these comments of really thoughtful comments. It's not just literally like one line, cool, nice video. It's like very thoughtful of people saying, I never thought about this for my work. I went and talked to my boss about this. Here's what she said. We're reflecting on this as a team. Is anybody else having this question? Like, here's a roadblock we ran into. How have other people solved this? So the course itself is interactive with the students. I wish I would have done that before. As I'm re-recording my old courses, that's absolutely something I'm going to do is have very explicit instructions. And in all my courses, people get emails Mondays at 11 saying like they have access to all the materials from the beginning. But I tell them like, I'm going to give you suggested pacing. So don't get too far ahead. Don't get too far behind. Let's try to kind of stay on this track, you know, so like this week, go watch these three videos and do these activities. And in the emails for this course, I very explicitly tell them like, if you just sit there like a bump on a log and watch the videos, you're not going to learn anything. I want you to comment on every single video. That is the expectation. Every single one, even if it's like, I just watched this video. I'm not sure quite how to do the activity. I've got to think about this. Like, even if it's something like that, just let's acknowledge that you're thinking about it too. Well, it makes sense that your courses that's would get better. That your courses would get better at the time and that, you know, like that, that structuring, you know, that you've now found, found it's like, yeah, it, it, it makes sense like to come into a class as a, as a student, like knowing like how things are, are laid out. Right. And yeah. then also um, the engagement and kind of the feedback piece. That's, that's uh, great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we can all be really biased, uh, especially uh, with respect, you know, bias or not seeing things quite clearly, especially with respect to our, our, what we do, our own work. How do you get honest input on your thought processes, your work that you do? Like, how do you like, how do you get that? Well, when you blog and YouTube and have online courses and a lot of your work's public facing like mine is, uh -huh. people tell you, people are very blunt. <laughs> and for, for better and for worse, I remember my first YouTube video that I ever posted. Yeah. You know, I was making this late at night. I was working, going to grad school. I had no mic. I had no webcam. I think I was wearing glasses in the video and the glare of the computer you yeah. couldn't even see my eyeballs. It was just like uh -huh. classic 10 years ago, YouTube quality. And, um, you know, now, now I have an actual microphone and, you know, I know what I'm doing now, but it took 10 years to figure that out. And I remember my first YouTube video, I posted it. And my first comment was from this anonymous internet woman, like <laughs> Janet one, two, three or something. Like, I didn't know who she was. She probably didn't know who I was. And she said something like in all caps, like screaming internet language, like all I can hear is the clicking sound of your fingers on the keyboard as you demonstrate this skill. You need a microphone. What type of quality is this? I can't even hear what you're saying over the clicking. And yeah. I was like, There's my bad, problem. Janet, one, two, three. I was trying to help you out of the goodness of my heart. Like my bad. So of course I went and got a microphone after that because I didn't want to have like anonymous internet people hate me. Um, so people tell you. Feedback. You took it as feedback. It wasn't just like you ignored her because of her like all no. caps. Deal. I hadn't thought yeah. about it. I right. didn't know people had microphones. Like who did I know who was doing anything on video? Right. Yeah. Nowadays we're all in, we're all on video in 2020, but that wasn't the case before. I had no idea. And now I've had to like watch YouTube videos on mic comparisons and lighting comparisons and webcam comparisons to kind of figure out like for my setup, what do I need? I've put a lot of thought into that now, but I didn't, I didn't know when I was. I have a, a fancy, you, you have a fancy mic. You have a mic with a vengeance right there. Yeah. And this fancy little like $4 foam hat on it to hopefully reduce some background noise. Yeah. Fancy, but um, yeah. And then I did a webinar. What was it a week ago, two weeks ago? 
and my phone number uh-huh. don't go stalk me now to all the people listening to this my phone number is on my website it's my business phone number goes uh-huh. to my cell phone so i as much as i wish when the phone rang i could just ignore it sometimes it's business calls so i have to pick it up and then you know hello this is ann emery how may i help you just in case it's a prospective client calling and this guy calls and he was like hi i paid for your webinar that you did yesterday and I have one problem with it. And I'm like, my heart's racing again, fight or flight mode. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to get chewed out. Cause he said, I have one problem with it. And he paused and I'm just like panicking thinking like, oh my gosh, what's, what's he about to say? And it, what it, he said, like, my one problem is that most presenters just read off a script and you didn't. You were a real person on the webinar. It was the best webinar I ever saw. I was like, thank goodness, because I was about to hang up on him. <laughs> and he said how he'd worked in TV. He was like a uh, news anchor on the local TV channel for years. And then he retired and started a nonprofit. And his nonprofit's doing evaluation and reporting, et cetera. And he needed some help. Um, and I was like, cool, I have some consultant friends who can help you. And I'm like uh, terrified. But people just call you up and they tell you what's on their mind very openly. And, and you have to listen with your poker face on and try not to hang up on them. And um, yeah, I'm also though, so that's from like, you know, public facing work that I do. I definitely hear feedback very bluntly. I'm in a couple of masterminds though with fellow business owners where we are each other's sounding boards and each other's brain trust. So I'll bounce ideas off of these friends and be like, I'm thinking about doing this thing with online courses. Do you think this would make the course better? And they'll flat out tell me like, no, that's a terrible idea. I tried that for my course last year. It was a huge flop don't do that. That would be a stupid idea. So that's really helpful to have a peer group too that you trust. Mastermind specifically with people who do like similar kind of work, not data viz, but like online courses, like, okay, great. Online courses and data. So Ben Collins is a Google Sheets instructor and has an online academy. David Kyes is an evaluation, but also does R trainings, R for the rest of us. Um, Dave Parody is a presentation design person um, in Canada. And he has courses on not just PowerPoint, but like financial data and graphs. Mm -hmm. Echo Rivera is an evaluation and does more of the presentation side, more for like university staff and people working on their PhD or just finishing their PhD. She has a really cool niche there. So yeah, it's people who do training online or in person, but they're, they're, we're in data enough in each other's worlds that we kind of understand each other's day to day. It's not like just... It's not just random people, you know, it's in this, we're in the same circles. When I do trainings, I collect feedback forms. I used to let the person organizing the workshop or conference do that. And it was sometimes done, but sometimes not. But I thought, okay, like I have an evaluation background. I should make sure my own work is evaluated every single time consistently. So I bring my own forms or create my own internet survey. Mm -hmm. Um, In some large client projects, I have a mix of large and small things. So large is like, in my world, anything is more than a couple months to complete or a couple of years. But I have a lot of small things too that are like a day of work. Um, but in the large projects, we just always build it in to have formal debriefs. And there's no finger pointing or anything. Like everybody likes each other. It's more like, hey, what did you all think when the timeline shifted? Was that reasonable? Kind of our plan B timeline? How did that affect everybody? What, what do we do if that happens again? Timelines always shift. How should we communicate better? And like, it's more just problem solving for like when these hiccups happen the next time, what should we do? Does Dropbox work for everybody? Should we move to OneDrive? What are your thoughts? Like we're, we're all just reflecting together. Um, and on short projects where there's not a formal debrief, I look for repeat clients if they hire me again, phew, even if it's, you know, two years later or referrals, if they're referring me to a friend, it's again, like, phew, I did some good work there. If I never hear from them again, um, that would, I would, I would worry or something, but most of these people, we, we like each other. So we'd stay in touch for years. How do you get, do you get feedback from the people who don't like, you know, like if you don't hear back from someone, then how do you sort of know like what the, you know, what might have happened or, I, mean, I guess, you know, maybe they don't, they don't need that kind of work. And, and sometimes it takes a few years, I guess, but um, how do you sort of get feedback that's maybe other fe- like elicit feedback that might be negative, like purposefully. Mm-hmm. So you have, you have the, I guess the feedback forms at the end of the workshops, 
Do you also do something at the end of your courses too? Like, is there something there or, yep, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, there are feedback forms that there, you know how I said there's automated emails that go out on Mondays. So at the end, they get sent to a survey. It's also inside the course too, it's just a Google form. It's not any fancy tech, it's just a three question Google form with the questions that I've found to be most useful. Um, and then, but I also have for courses, I have data behind the scenes in my course platform so I can see what percentage of the way completed each person is. You know, have they, have they never logged in at all? Have they logged in every single day? Which videos have they actually watched or not? They have video heat maps right. where you can see, did somebody only watch the first minute of a 10 minute video? If so, like my first minute was probably pretty boring if they didn't keep watching it or wasn't applicable to their job. I think it's, it's yellow if they watched it and then it's red if they rewatched it. So you can see for your videos and you can overlay like all 75 people's heat map for like video A and you can see, oh, everybody rewatched from minute three to three minutes and 30 seconds. Was I stumbling through my explanation? Did I not have a good visual to score me? So you have that backend data too, to see like, where did people maybe get stuck and have to rewatch things? So that's really helpful. So yeah, so your, your online, all the online stuff, there's uh, data that's tracked. So I think that's, that's super helpful. What, which, which resource do you use to develop your courses again? You, you develop it in, where is it, what is it again? I use Teachable. There's lots of good platforms out there. Um, Kajabi is a good one. I've, I've taken courses on Kajabi and really like that one. That's like an all-in-one tool though, where it's your, your website and your blog uh -huh. and your courses and your newsletter. Yeah. I don't want to be like dissing Kajabi. I think very highly of my student experience on Kajabi, but I don't know if it's possible for any platform to be perfect at it's your website and your blog and it's your course platform and it's your mailing list. So I use separate tools for each of those things. Yeah, Teachable, Kajabi. What else do people use? Thinkific is another popular one. I hear promising things about Udemy is more of a, what's it called? Like a marketplace, like where anybody can create a course and you can go on and search for courses. So you're searching for the topic area more than the instructor. Like you might search Excel pivot tables and you'll see like 50 million Excel pivot table courses that exist. Right. What are some others? Like There's teachable. a bunch. Okay. You, you like teachable. You're sticking with it for now. Okay. Got it. The, your, your ideas for your like most recent blog posts, let's for example, for example, like where do you get these ideas from? You know, like where, yeah. like what, what do you decide to blog on? Cause you blog pretty regularly, right? Like once a week, once I every do. couple. You, yeah. yeah. I think I've had 250 posts uh -huh. since 2012. So it's about every other week. This year has been actually more like once a week because Finally, about a year ago, I hired a virtual assistant and what she can do for me in five hours a week, it's amazing. It's things that would have taken me 10 hours. So, you know, I'll write the blog post in Word, but then she goes into the website and adds alt text to the images, makes sure that it's a heading one or a heading two, makes sure all the links do, you know, that maybe takes 30 minutes, but I don't have those 30 minutes. So that's really freed me up and helped me publish more regularly. I usually write blog posts just on questions that workshop participants or course participants ask, just FAQ type things. If everybody is struggling with, how do I know if my colors are accessible? Right. I would make a great blog post. I do a lot of before and after makeovers, which help people see. I don't just show like, here's the before and here's this drastic after version after I spent hours on it. I don't think that's helpful to people, maybe to give them like something for their data viz wall of fame or something. But I try to show, okay, here's, here's after I've done one little thing and here's another screenshot after I've done one other little thing and one other little thing right. and talk them through the behind the scenes process of what I was thinking about as I went um, because they're not gonna have the same data set in their job, but if they can follow the thought process, that's what I want them to replicate. More right. recently, I've been doing interviews like this to try to get to know the people in DataViz and just data communications more broadly better. Yeah. What about you? Cause you blog pretty regularly too. Not regularly, but uh, I'll, I'll put stuff in LinkedIn more, more often. Yeah. Um, and uh, for me, it's just like things that I'm working on, like problems that come up, you know, and like how I solve them. If I hear that other people have not kind of heard of that approach or, you know, that, that I think could be helpful for others then I'll, you know, and, and I also find it interesting. Like, I'll, yeah, I'll actually want to put some time into writing something up about this. Then, you know, and I'll do that. So like right now I'm, 
I'm working on something on, on how to do the, use like, there's a transla translation app that you can use that goes well with like SurveyMonkey and other uh, apps that, uh, that are, that's open source, allows you to, to take a survey and then like in, the, in SurveyMonkey, for instance, you could have one survey and you select the language, right? But you have to do the translation. Anyway, there's a method there's a, to, to actually uh, do the translation um, in a, like a more efficient way. And there's another evaluator I spoke with who had that, that problem. And so that's, that's something I had to use on a study. So, um, so that's, that was just like an example of, you know, something that I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. So, yeah. 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 I mean, finding a topic that you personally care about is key because I don't think blogging is supposed to feel like work. It's supposed yeah. to be, I mean, sure. I guess you could monetize your blog. I have ads on my blog, but they don't bring in much money. You know, like it, it would take a lot to, to make a full-time living from a blog. Sure. It's and sure it can lead to referrals and, and future projects, but it's mostly a hobby, right. you know, it's supposed to be fun. So I think, yeah, I love the idea of just thinking about like, what's interesting to you and what do you want to explore a little bit more? Yeah, totally. Um, so books, uh, books you, book you would recommend. I like to ask this to people, I always get good ideas for books. Um, so a book you would either recommend that you find yourself buying for other people or just recommending or whatever, uh, something maybe more recent, but it, you go back in time, whatever. Yeah. I have gifted all of my in-laws, my, my sister's in-law, sister-in-laws. I don't know. My husband's siblings. I have gifted all four of them, uh, your money or your life by Vicki Robin. Have you heard of that one? I haven't, no. no. She published it back in the 90s for the first time. It's a New York Times best-selling list book for a few years. She just did a redo a couple of years ago. With It's, it's a financial book, kind of. She talks about budgeting and, and money a little bit, but it's more about thinking about your life energy, as she calls it. Thinking about you're only alive for so long. You have a limited number of days how can you make the best use of your time? And it's a lot about trying to avoid just consuming things that give you temporary happiness. Like I'm going to go on that vacation for a week. And for that week, mm -hmm. once I finally unwind by about day six, I'll have a great time and I'll spend thousands of dollars. But it's like not aiming just to consume for temporary happiness, but thinking about how do you create for long-term life satisfaction, which is a big part of like blogging and teaching for me too, is that creation process. Um, and that book actually, my husband and I were listening to the ebook version on vacation a couple of years ago. We had a long car drive, 10 or 12 hours or something. And we're listening to that ebook. We're pausing it every 30 seconds to talk. I think that's how you know a book's good when you're like, I can't wait to talk to somebody about this. I have this idea. It sparked this new insight for me. And um, I don't, do you know that I used to travel full time? Do you know that about me? Yeah, yeah, so sure. that it was yeah. that book and that car ride that we we're listening to Vicki Robbins say like, don't be throwing away your life in a job that's only decent. You're aiming for, for like a great job and a great setup where maybe you don't need to have a job. Maybe you should be a stay at home parent or something. We were like, he should quit his job. We had that. We we're like, that's, that's the answer. He doesn't need to work anymore. He should just be a stay at home dad and we should have more family time and like, take the husband and the kids on the road with my job as I travel around the world. So that book very clearly changed my life trajectory. And as people I know now, family members are reading the book, they are reflecting very deeply on their career and, you know, their life and where it's headed to. So that that's a good one. Um, Atomic Habits uh -huh. by James Clear. Have you heard of that one? I think it's the number one New York Times bestseller right now. Yeah, I have a little video on it uh, and applying his approach to meditation, like how to make meditation a habit. I used his, his mo the model that he walks through. It's a good book. Yeah, I love that one. I mean, so actionable for everybody in every industry. I think everybody can gain something from Atomic Habits. What about you? Do you have favorites? I'll add them to my reading list. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough. Uh, depends. Uh, it depends on the person I'm talking to. So I don't know if it's very specific, but I, I really like, I'm, I'm really into, uh, I'm, I'm taking some classes right now. So, but uh, some of the Stephen Kotler stuff on uh, flow um, related mm -hmm. to flow. So he has uh, uh, the rise of Superman and, and it's a good book. Um, also Bernard, Bernardo Castro is not well known, but he writes on, it's a philosophy book. It's on, uh, uh, idealism uh, versus materialism. So it's like, what, it's like what with the nature of reality. But to me, it's it's not so that abstract thing. It's just like, 
it, it, like I'm, I'm struggling to sort of make that uh, inform how I live my life. So it's not some academic philosophical nonsense. It's very like practical. I think he's, I think he's one of the most important writers right now, actually. Um, I hope to be able to interview him at some point. I think we have some overlapping interests there too. I know that you're into meditation. That's something I've just recently kind of dipped my toe in and some breath work too, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, we'll have to have some other podcasts doing a yes. book review sometime. Definitely, definitely. We have a group of evaluators who are into meditation. Um, and so we're, at, we're working on a publication now, a few of us, but we're talking about doing a, a take a, on that one day, maybe. Let's see. Huh. Um, I think there's interest in it. So, uh, so kind of wrapping up here. So how do you structure your day usually so you get the most uh, done um, to, in terms of work productivity, but just sort of life in general? So kind of, um, yeah. That's a tricky one because I think there's this perception like Anne Emery must wake up at 5 a.m. and run 10 miles and then make a green smoothie and then work, work, work till midnight and she never sleeps and she must be miserable, clearly. Yeah. I get a lot done but I also rest and have fun. I don't see those as, as opposing dichotomous topics at all. I think you can have this like wonderfully fulfilling personal life and achieve a lot in your professional life at the same time. So I, are you into minimalism at all? You might be if you're into meditation, if we're into some of the same things. Have you heard of, yeah, you've heard of minimalism? Yeah, sure. I mean, in theory, I am. Uh, it's hard to uh, actually stick to, um, but yeah. So I'm not into it in the sense of like Marie Kondo says you have to fold your clothes a certain way. Like I don't care about how you fold your clothes, but I'm into it in terms of thinking about what really matters in your work life and your personal yeah. life, which ideally are the are ideally are the same thing. I'm working on integrating mine more and more, but really thinking about what matters and you just have to let go of everything else. So my husband let go of his very good salary job with a pension with a top secret security clearance. Like we let that go. So we no longer have to do things like we both wake up with alarm clocks and we rush the kids off to daycare and then he works and I works and who's making dinner and blah, blah, blah. It's like, we don't set alarm clocks. We get enough rest every day. Like that's, that's key. Like anytime we find ourselves setting our alarm clock, I'm thinking my life is out of control. Why did I book something before 10 a.m.? Like if I'm going to wake up at eight or nine, like I can't book anything till 10. It's just, it's doesn't make sense for my life. Um, we purposefully, when we, we had to stop, you know, our full-time travel from COVID. So when we were house hunting in Florida, we looked very specifically for a house with a very specific layout. We wanted a one story house. We'd mm -hmm. lived in a townhouse around DC before we we're up and down stairs all day long. You lose so much time up and up and down. And like, then you forgot your keys and they're on the third floor and then your shoes are way down. It's total, total waste of my life yeah. going up and down stairs. So we wanted a one level house. But the office that I'm in is the only thing that's on the second level. It's this bonus room above the two car garage. So that has the perfect noise separation. And it's my little retreat. Like I go into my office, I get all my work time done. I get into my flow state, my uninterrupted work time. And when I'm done, I like go down the stairs and go, go home. So that physical setup is key. I use Calendly for scheduling meetings. I don't, I don't do the thing over email anymore. Like, when are you available? When are you available? I just send people a Calendly link for the right length of meeting time. Right. And I'm only available from Mondays at noon until Thursday. I don't book anything on Monday morning. That's a terrible way to start your week with back-to-back -back calls, I think. And I don't book anything for Fridays because by Friday, if my brain's tired, I'm not going to be any good on a Zoom call. You know, I don't book things for that day. So Friday is usually my day for myself to write a blog post, record videos for online courses. And it feels really good to end your week like that, knowing you're doing something creative for yourself. Um, gosh, I bet we've like read some similar books or podcasts on this. Identifying whether you're a, what's the technical term? Whether you're a creator or you're more of a manager or a delegator. Mm -hmm. And making sure you're not trying to go back and forth. Like, it's not like I'm going to spend one hour writing this blog post, creating, and then mm -hmm. I have a 30 minute meeting about a project. And then I'm going to try to spend one more hour writing a blog post. Like, you have to really separate it into really like a half day of uninterrupted work time to do the actual work, the creative work, doing mm -hmm. the evaluation, writing the evaluation report, and then try to book all your meetings back to back and some other time. And then, because I used to just have them like, 
all flippy floppy. It didn't, it didn't work. It was so unproductive to have things scheduled throughout the day. Um, gosh, I've listened to whole podcast episodes too about being so careful to know if you're a morning person, an afternoon person, or a late night person. I used to be a late night person. I used to have to do my best work at like 9 p.m. midnight, yeah, me too. but now I'm a morning person. So mm-hmm. making sure that my mornings are my uninterrupted work time where I don't I rarely look at email. I'm not responding to emails in the morning. I'm like building courses, doing writing. And then in the afternoons when I'm tired, that's usually when I schedule other types of calls because yeah. for, you have to be awake. You can't right. go take a nap if you're tired. Like maybe I'll take a walk or something to refresh myself, but it's like, it kind of, you have to be there but you really need a hundred percent of your brain energy for the creative work. Gosh, there's so many things. I, I love productivity thinking and everything, but what about you? Do you have any tips that I haven't thought of yet? I think it's great. Well, first of all, getting good sleep um, is, is probably the, the first, the most important yeah. thing. And I got to start to, to focus on that after reading Matt Walker's book on, I think it's why we sleep, something like that. And he has a, there's a good interview with him. Uh, Peter Atia interviews him. And a guy goes through that. Actually, they have three interviews now. Um, so that just getting getting that honed in, and and uh, that's that's been huge. That's been huge. And then being okay with taking breaks during the course of the day, like actually building that in and making sure that you know I'm just sort of going through a cycle, not just sort of powering through. And so those those are just like a couple of things that have yeah. been have been really big. And then med- meditation's been big. It's been a lot. I've been doing it for about five years, and it's, it's affected me uh, a lot also. And I think, I think a lot of, most, a lot of people I talk to that, that do it, um, it one way or the other, it, 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 it has a nice impact. So it's cool. Yeah. Do you have a particular style or approach of meditation you like? I don't know all the names, but then I can read up on the kind that, that you like. Yeah. For, I just, well, I, I started with, um, sort of, sort of a, a focused, uh, like a Vipassana, uh, or insight, uh, meditation where you just focus on your experience. You start by just First, try and train your uh, a mind, your attention to focus on an object, typically your, your breath. Uh, then uh, now I'm shifting more to just focusing on uh, awareness itself. So it sounds a little weird, but uh, so awareness of awareness is the sort of the, that, that the practice now. Um, again, if you just think about, you know, fundamentally, what are you? Your, you know, your awareness, you know, and so just noticing that and so sitting with that. So again, so it might to some people it might sound strange or whatever, but it's actually, that's, that's what I do now. Yeah. That's uh, not strange for me at all. I mean, I've started doing breath work, which at first I was like, this is really woo woo. Uh-huh. I'll try it anyway, because I keep hearing people swear by it and it's fantastic. It's so interesting. I, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to a float pod. Have you heard of those? Yeah. Like a float tank or different? Float tank. Yeah. It's like zero sensory. You I think you hear very little and you're floating in salt water somehow. So you're kind of a little bit buoyant and you lay in there for like an hour and just kind of let your thoughts flow however they need to flow. Uh, I've heard really good things about those from really scientific high achieving people who are not woo woo. (laughs) Like it's a great way to recharge, you know, just like all of these things are. So I think it's, it, it can be fantastic. And then the Epsom salt that they put in there also is really good too. So Hmm. Yeah, it's nice. Well, cool. How, how should people stay in touch with you, uh, follow your work? Like where, where do people follow you? Yeah, the best place is probably to check out that mini course that I made a few years ago that I've, I, I told you it was seven random YouTube videos at first. It's not that anymore. I re-recorded it a couple months ago. So it has a very clear beginning and middle end with activities with I think three or 4,000 people have taken it now. So you can read tons of comments and insights of fellow researchers and evaluators. Uh, um, but if you go to my website, it's depictdatastudio.com, D-E-P-I-C-T, datastudio.com. Okay. There's a button for online courses. And then that course is called Soar Beyond the Dusty Shelf Report. Uh, and that's a good just mindset course, a good place to start and kind of understand more of what we were talking about today that uh, you can like read the key ideas, watch some videos with a lot of tips and tricks from recent projects too. Nice. Okay. And then uh, is it is it uh, Twitter, LinkedIn? What what do you uh, which which one is the best or which ones? Instagram. Probably probably Instagram now. I know the DataViz community and evaluation community is on Twitter, so I still use Twitter a lot. And of course, all of us are on LinkedIn professionally. But um, 
all of my behind the scenes of like what it's actually like to work for myself, I post on Insta stories. So I don't have a huge following on there. It's, it has not been a priority to get a huge following, but the connections I do have on there have been really great. And like some real genuine connections of people being able to just say, Oh, like you're struggling with this thing. So am I. Oops. Sorry. My calendar's popping up. It's time to do virtual preschool with my four-year-old. All right. Great. Well, that is much more important than this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to teach a human how to read somehow. I don't know how I'm going to do that and count. And I tried making graphs with her and she was like, can we do Play-Doh instead? <laughs> I failed. I failed. What type of database person am I? Well, there's going to have to be some trickery on your, on your behalf there. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Well, it's good talking with you. We'll, we'll post this. We'll post a lot of the information that we talked about also in the, in, on YouTube and also on LinkedIn. And, and uh, it's great. Good talking with you. All right. Thanks, James. See you later.